Hello, and welcome to Mornings with Joel, commercial real estate podcast, where we focus on rising stars and established players in commercial real estate and talk to them about how they are building legacies in today's marketplace. Sean, I wanted to uh, thank you this morning. You are here with us with the Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. We want to thank everyone that's here in attendance today. And uh, we certainly appreciate you listening to this podcast on whatever medium you choose to listen to it with. So, Deshaun, we're really excited to have you with us today. And um, it's amazing. We were just talking off camera how uh, there's so many people that we, we know between us. And um, I guess you could say LinkedIn and some other circles. And yet, and still, we've never actually sat down and spoke before, at least that I know of. So uh, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah. It <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm glad we can make it happen. That eventually, we're, we were meant to uh, meet. So I'm glad I have this opportunity. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you, you got on my radar because you've been doing some uh, pretty impressive things. And uh, as you know, the, the focus of this podcast has really been to focus on ones that are trying to, to do more in the commercial real estate space that might be minorities and the like. And it looks like you have a similar interest to what we're doing as well. So let me have you do this. If you don't mind, introduce yourself and then we'll go into a little bit of your, your background and uh, why I want to be here today. All right, great. Well, again, thank you so much for uh, for having me. I'm Darshan Kendrick, the founder of Kendrick Advisory and Advocacy Group. So we're a corporate securities law firm slash investment advisory firm. So we help companies all over the country when they are raising investor capital. We're not broker dealers, so we don't find money, but we focus on making sure that our founders, when they're raising capital, can focus on growing their business and returning that money back to the investors with a viable product or service and leaving all the back end stuff, all the regulations, all the documentation to us so that they can be the best founders that they can be. And we've helped companies nationwide raise over $1 billion in private investment capital. And because we are an investment advisory firm as well, because I have a Series 65, we also work with investment groups and venture capital firms in order to provide investment advice when they are looking to deploy capital into, into investments. So we have sort of a dual role as a law firm and an investment advisory firm, but I love capital markets. I love uh, to see the flow of money. And particularly, I have a professional and personal mission of creating as many Black millionaires and billionaires through entrepreneurship as possible. So that's that's my life mission. Okay. All right. Well, that's awfully impressive. And, you know, you brought up an issue about raising capital. I'm a capital markets guy, so we're definitely going to talk a little bit more about that. It's really interesting that you've fallen into this space, if, to use that term, if you will. But obviously, uh, from what I understand, your, your parents were entrepreneurs as well. So maybe you didn't really fall into this space. But tell us a little bit about your background, because I understand you're, you're a homegrown talent. I am born and raised here in Georgia, born at Grady. So I am a Georgia peach. Uh, but my family actually has been here for many, many generations. So I guess we just love Georgia. But both of my parents were entrepreneurs, blue collar entrepreneurs. And growing up, I saw that they struggled not only with legal services, but with access to capital, which every entrepreneur, right, is eventually going to need. And so I knew I wanted to go to law school. And at first I thought I wanted to be a civil rights attorney until I found out how much they don't make. And I said, well, these student loans are not going to get paid by their sales. So let me go into something that still can help entrepreneurs. But, you know, I can I can survive paycheck to paycheck. Right. And I really got interested in securities law. And when you think about the landscape of attorneys that are in this space, helping companies with capital raising, there are not a lot of people that look like me, particularly Black women attorneys. And uh, I love the work that I do. It is fascinating. I actually do arbitration for FINRA, which is the Financial Regulatory Authority. So I negotiate between issuing companies and investors all the time. So that helps me hone in my skills. And it really is just a joy. Every time that an entrepreneur can hit their mark, or comes to us for advice and we're able to guide them through the capital raising process, it not only gives me 
a professional sense of um, happiness, but it gives me personal joy as well because access to capital is one of those things, particularly in the United States, you can get so tripped up if you don't know what you're doing. So I do, you know, some extra stuff outside of being um, a lawyer, sort of centered around this theme around uh, wealth generation and capital raising, but I really do enjoy the work that I do over here. And it, it really is you know, such a joy to to spread the word about all the options that are out there for people who are looking to raise capital. Yeah, yeah, very, very good point. Very good point. And um, I want you to speak a little bit more about this. Now, I know firsthand what it's all about because being a capital markets guy, that's all I do is is get capital for deals, right? So I, I know it firsthand. But for those who might be listening, why is why is that that's so important? You know, you hear about people bootstrapping. You know, you hear of of so many other things. Why can't I just prepare a proposal and just send it out there and just start raising capital and uh, asking people to invest in my projects. Why can't I just do that? Well, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, the first reason you, you, you can't do that is because it's illegal. I mean, that's probably the first thing. And listen, uh, one of the things that is a part of my law firm and investment advisory firm is education, because a lot of people do think well, I can just start raising money. I'm just raising, raising you know, $2,000 from family and friends. Anytime you're raising money from somebody else, there's a regulatory thing that goes along with it. So a lot of it's just about education because people think they can just go out there and start raising money. But the second thing is, you know, from a business standpoint, even if it was not illegal to start raising capital and not filing any paperwork or, or making sure you're within the regulatory framework, from a protection standpoint, it's not a very wise move because I will tell you that investment law is very, can be very tricky. It, the rules are updating all the time. It can be a landmine. So from a protection standpoint, you want to make sure that you have somebody that's going to guide you through that process and give you some practical tips based on experience, because there are so many things that can trip you up if you don't have the right documentation or if you're even saying the wrong thing. And uh, I always tell people that everybody talks about how harsh the IRS is, the Internal Revenue Service. But if you have never encountered the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the federal agency that is over investments, then you have not met your match because the Securities and Exchange Commission can do everything up to recommend that you be put in jail. So they really are a powerful force to be reckoned with. So you want to make sure that you're raising capital the right way. And um, I try to provide that that service as much as I can. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes good sense. And uh, it's interesting. You used even such a small amount. You said two grand. I know you kind of said that, you know, with a degree of hyperbole there, but your, your point is well taken. Anytime you're going outside yourself and actually raising money for an investment, it could be a little dicey from that standpoint. Now, you mentioned something else that I, I want to dive into a little bit deeper because you kind of drew this dichotomy between the working to run your business and the actual raising of capital. Why can't a person just do both? You know, let's say I get a good attorney and I just do both. You know, why, why can't I just do both? Is there a problem with that doing that or how does that uh, work with my time and the things I need to get done? Well, if you if you have an attorney, the point is that you shouldn't have to do both if you have the right attorney. So I tell founders all the time, when you are raising capital, there's sort of a two-track mind. It takes a lot of time, effort, and focus to raise capital alone, let alone develop a business and then try to do all the regulatory and internal documents that you need to do. What we try to do is take half of that work off of you. So you don't have to worry about regulatory things. You don't have to worry about documentation. What we need you to do as a founder is to go back to your business plan, perfect your product or service, and figure out what is the best way to have, help your company succeed. Leave the rest of it to us. You focus on how you're going to get those investors back their money. And so we try to take half of that burden off of you um, because at the end of the day, you can raise a, a, a lot of money on your own and try to do all the documentation and things yourself. But I find that when you try to do that, you're overstressed and you're not focusing on the actual business. You're focusing on investor negotiations and investor documents and trying to figure out if you fit within this rule or that rule and if this rule has updated and who you need to send paperwork with. That's a lot to do 
at the same time of trying to perfect and develop a business. So we try to take that burden off of you. So do, you can focus on um, growing your company and, and leave all the regulations and documentations to us so that you can be the best founder and have the best chances of success uh, that you possibly can. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for bringing that out. And, and that's really the point that I wanted you to mention because um, I've heard it so many times where people say, you know, all I do is just spend my time chasing capital. You know, they don't have time to actually run their business. And like you mentioned, they're dealing with this regulatory issue or that regulatory issue, and it just becomes a, a bowl of, of soup, if you will, where they're really not getting anything done. You know, so it's very, very important. You know, one other thing I was thinking about in, in that regard, you mentioned about getting investors back their money. I can tell you that it's so very important that, um, you know, investors, that you execute on your business plan. You know, it's one thing to raise capital and tell people you're doing all this stuff, but uh, if you don't execute on that business plan, it, it can be flawed. And even if you do execute and your securities status is not straight, then you can have all kinds of problems as well and the whole thing can get derailed. Have you seen that happen at all? I, I mean, I've been practicing law for over 15 years. I can't tell you how many times I've, <laughs> I've had that happen. And, and, I, and I tell people, you know, at the at the end of the day, investors are happy, you know, when everything is going well, but let something go wrong. <laughs> let something go wrong. And all of a sudden, everybody has amnesia. And so that's why it's so important to document things, so important to do things the right way. Because when you have a happy investor, everybody's happy. But when you have a disgruntled investor, that's when things can really take a turn and just cause more stress and money and things like that. So I tell people, do it right the first way, the early way, and just have the peace of mind. Even though the, it is an investment to, you know, to do this type of work, you have the peace of mind of knowing if anything goes wrong, that everything um, has been taken care of and you can rest assured that you know your business is not going to go under or you're not going to get a nasty letter from the SEC or any other state agency. Um, it really is about giving founders peace of mind of knowing that they're doing it the right way. And at the end of the day, that investment that you make on the front end will pay so many more dividends and peace of mind on, on the back end. So, uh, you know, to your to to your point, it is one of those things that you you have to make an investment in, and you have to execute on your plans to make sure that, that investor is as happy of an investor as you can possibly make them. Yeah, yeah. Could you imagine having that conversation where you say, "Well, you know, I thought I could save a few dollars in legal fees by doing this myself," and I filed the paperwork and I was going to, you know, just hopefully give you a higher return and save a few dollars, you know, that's yeah. the kind of things you don't want to have when things go south. <laughs> you you, def you definitely don't want, want, want to have that conversation. And what I found over the years, actually, is that particularly new startups, when they're pitching, the number one reason that people invest in companies is going to be your team, because no matter how good your idea is, if, they, if the investor doesn't think you can execute on it, they don't think you have the capabilities and team, they're not going to invest. I don't care how good your idea is. Execution is everything. Idea is just the starting point. And so if you can list that you have a good CPA on your team, that you have strong founders, and that you have a good securities attorney, that actually helps you raise capital. So I, you know, I tell people, you know, we 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 are here to get you to your goal, but you have to allow us to help you. And that that investment again up front um, really just is worth a pound of cure uh, in the end. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good point. You know, the team, I didn't think about adding that to our discussion today, but that's actually a very, very good point. You know, the team plays into it because, again, it goes back to the point of execution. You know, if you can't execute on your business plan, what difference does it make? And if you're going to cut corners to save a few dollars, that doesn't work out as well. So it, it is vitally important. So thank you for, for sharing that. So let me ask this. I, I know that, um, you know, you, you actually teach a whole class about this, so we don't want to take away from that. But just to kind of give us some, some tidbits, how does a person actually get started down this path? You know, you, you see this area where you say, I could build an apartment complex there, that would be great. Or, you know, whatever it might be. You know, I heard of this through the news and here's, uh, you know, Microsoft is moving to this side of town, so now I want to build something over there. How do they actually get started and at what point should they engage a firm like yourself in order to get started in that process? 
So I tell people, as soon as you think you want, as soon as you think that you want to raise uh, capital from investors, give us a call. We have one and two hour consultations, even after hours and on the weekends where we consult with people and figure out, really have an in-depth discussion about one, is investor capital right for you? Because it's not right for everybody, right? There's debt capital and and other types of uh, financing that you could use. So we want to make sure that investor capital is the route that you want to go. And then we really sit down and think about what the strategy is in order to get you to their point. So there's a big regulatory scheme out there and there's several options for raising capital. So we really hone in what is the right financing strategy for you? What does that look like? What does the timeline look like? And I always suggest a timeline of six to 12 months before you actually want to start raising capital. Now, you might say that sure does seem like a long time. And the reason is because, again, depending on your financing strategy, I might have to fill out a 50 page you know, document to submit to a federal agency. You, that's not going to happen overnight, right? Because they're going to be back and forth and revisions and things like that. Plus, I suggest before you start soliciting investors that you get all your internal documents together. And there's also, depending on your financing strategy, there's different timelines that trigger as soon as you make an offer to an investor. They don't have to actually accept it. Once you make an offer to an investor, as defined under the Securities and Exchange Commission, that starts a timeline in which you have to file paperwork. So I say the sooner, the better. So I can set you up and tell you what you can do, what you can't do, what the timeline is, because I am a vitamin attorney. I am not a pill attorney. So once you get into trouble, I can't help you because I don't do litigation. I help you avoid getting sick and getting into trouble. I don't help you once you're already in trouble and sick. So that's my, what really what I see my role is. Right. Good illustration. I, I appreciate that. Let me ask this also. Do you advise people on creating funds? Like should they do a blind fund or maybe an uh, open fund where they're getting investments per transaction? Or uh, what's your thoughts on that? And, and where, where do you fit in a situation like that? I don't do a lot of that type of work. Mostly what we do is um, advise about like venture capital funds or private equity funds or investment groups. Or as of recently during the pandemic, as you probably can imagine, I did a lot of advising on um, social groups that essentially were Ponzi schemes, but they tried to call them something different. So I tried to take people who who think that they're doing something legal and 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 tell them that they're not doing that they're doing something illegal and help them get to the way where they're not doing a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme, scheme which seemed to pop up a lot during the pandemic. I can advise on those types of funds, mutual funds and all all types of funds that you can set up, but the majority of what we're doing right now is really in the VC space, private equity space, investment groups, and again, these social groups that are popping up where they are very much Ponzi schemes, but they think they're not Ponzi schemes. Yeah, gotcha. I could imagine a lot of those popping up. You know, I'm sitting at home and I can get into this thing while I recruit a few people and do this and do that and make a ton of money. Yeah, that could be uh, fraught with a, a lot of problems. So I just understand yeah. that. And, uh, and just to clarify, I wasn't talking a um, like a close fund, like a mutual fund or something like that. I was actually talking more of uh, you have a blind fund where you raise capital where like a, a BlackRock, for an example, would be a blind fund where you're putting money in and you're trusting that investment team to make those investments for you. Obviously, those can be set up as well. And then you also have funds where you're actually raising capital per deal and having mm-hmm. people put in, uh, you know, per transaction. So I would assume you advise on on both scenarios like that, depending on what type of structure the person wants. Yeah, we can advise on those structures and any other types of structure that you can imagine. Of course, every few months I see different innovative ways to structure capital raising. So any other, you know, ways that pop up, we can advise on it. So as long as we're not conflicted out or anything like that, anything that involves capital raising or capital markets, we can advise on. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let me ask you about something else because there's a, in, in, in addition to everything that you're doing and you're doing it on a national scale, you also have a focus. You mentioned that you had a focus of trying to help minorities raise capital. And why, why do you feel that that's so important? The fact of having access to capital as minorities, as opposed to access to capital for other groups. 
Is that one of the reasons for the disparity that we see in, in society today, you think? Yeah, that's one of many reasons. Don't get me, you know, I'm also an elected official, so don't get me preaching oh. about um, the policy piece around why there's a cataclysm between black wealth and white wealth, but that is one of the reasons is access to capital. And it's also on the other side. So whenever I talk about access to capital, I also encourage people to be on the other side of the table, right? So we can talk about going into a room and pitching to people who don't look like us, but we need people on the other side who are being pitched to that look like us as well. So uh, I tell people, if you're an accredited investor, I, I happen to be an accredited investor and I have a mastermind group of accredited investors. I encourage them to make sure they're on the other side of the table as well. So that when people walk into a room and they look like us, that just lowers the stress level of a founder that's pitching to us. But also we understand historically and culturally uh, have a better understanding to what that person person is pitching. So really it's on both sides of the table, having access to capital, but also having access to opportunities to invest in people that look like us as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. I know I was having a conversation with one guy at one point and uh, he was upset that he didn't get a board seat on a particular large institution and that they were wanting to give that to a minority. And uh, it was interesting that it was so hard for him to understand that if you have a complete board of 50 year old white men with gray hair, you know, where, how do they understand how to grow their business and help others that are actually trying to do business with them? And it was just kind of baffling to me that, that he couldn't understand that, but that, that certainly happens out there. Yeah, it does. But, yeah. But you, you spoke about that because um, access to capital is a is a major thing. You know, it's um, it's not that anyone on any other side or any other racial group is smarter or anything else. It's just having access to the opportunities, having access to the capital, having access to knowing how to build a team, having access to good attorneys that can help direct you through the, the minefields of the SEC. All those things are so vitally important. You know, do you see it the same way or do you have a, a different opinion on that? No, I mean, that's absolutely the gist of it, right? Having access to, to capital and having access to information so that you know how to raise capital. We just launched a, a YouTube channel under Kendrick Advisory, if anybody's interested in subscribing, where we upload these video shorts um, really meant to dispel some myths to guide people um, and give them practical tips about capital raising. That's why we started our Investor Readiness Academy, uh, where we have a series of classes really to take people from start to finish through the capital raising process. So a lot of this is about access to capital. But before we even get to that, I'm really focused and honed in on getting people the information that they need so that they get prepared so that when that access to capital is there, they are prepared. They know what to say, what not to say, what the opportunities look like, what the you know what the bad money looks like, because not all money is good money. So they are equipped once they get to the, to that point of having access to capital. So I try to be very very comprehensive mm -hmm. in the way that we work with clients and prospective clients because you know do, just doing legal paperwork and filing stuff that's not going to get my founders, particularly my female and minority founders, to the point where the next time they do a raise, they're that much more educated, right? It's about educating them more and more and more so this becomes second nature because the goal is for that person who knows about capital raising to help somebody else and help somebody else. And then that will create this ecosystem, this building up, particularly in the Black community, of people who are knowledgeable about what it takes to raise capital. So it's sort of a perpetual giving back process that I'm that I'm trying to create here. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a beautiful thing, and I'm I'm glad you you brought that up. <clears throat> you know, the the information side of this is is so vitally important. There's a lot of folks that will look at the office buildings, even in downtown Atlanta, and they'll say, well, I could never afford that. How could I ever do that? But yet, and still understanding how these people access capital to get those deals done is vitally important. And it's the whole difference between being successful and getting things done and not being successful and getting things done. So that, that is very important. And you mentioned about um, helping minorities in, in this particular role. 
it's amazing the the lack of knowledge that's uh, available by by so many. And so, what have you been doing? I've noticed you've promoted some things out there that actually help educate individuals, kind of as a starting point, in order to help them understand what needs to happen as they go down this journey. You want to tell us a little bit about the some of the educational stuff that you do in that regard? Yeah, certainly. So one of the things that I mentioned before is we just launched our um, our YouTube channel and we're really trying to get more into into the social media realm to really have people um, be able to take a look at our education and stuff at their leisure and, and, and to be pithy, right? Because I know it is a lot of information, so we're not trying to bore you you know, with 30 minutes segment segments and things like that. So you'll notice on YouTube, they're very, very short pieces. They cover a wide range of just things that you need to know in the capital raising space. But the other thing that we launched is our Investor Readiness Academy, which we've just launched our third course on finding your financing strategy, which I mentioned before, is sort of the backbone of how you figure out how to go forward to raise capital. And it's a self-paced online module that people can purchase the class. I think it's like $50 or something like that. And it has quizzes in it. There's a live Q&A with me in the middle of October. And it's a way for people to get sort of the backdrop education that they that they need the the access to me to ask them any any ask any any questions that they may have and to really take them from start to finish in the capital raising space so we started with should you use debt or equity for our first course and then we started with capital structure like what kind of capital raising structure do you should you choose from in order to raise capital and now we're on this third course and as long as people are interested we'll just progress all the way through pitching through the to different documents that you need all through about a 10 or 11 course series um, so it really is meant to empower to be self-paced for people to to interact it's on an interactive platform for discussions and things like that but you know I'm trying to make it as convenient <laughs> obviously as I, I can because I, I am busy as well as everybody else so it's very hard to do these one-on-one types of educational sessions but but I'm hopeful that that is um, that is helpful as well. And anybody who follows me on any social media will know that I try to promote and, and articles and videos and things as much as possible. So hopefully that has been helpful as well. Yeah, yeah, no. Appreciate you sharing that and giving us that information. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and start uh, opening up the line. So if you have questions, uh, put those in the chat and uh, or you can raise your virtual hand and we'll, um, we'll take those comments as well. I did want to mention to Sean one thing that actually just really hit me, and it has to do with raising of capital, and it shows the importance of having access to it. You know, here in the United States, uh, as long as you have some source of income, you can go get a loan, maybe save up 3%, 5%, whatever it is, you get a house, that type of thing. And I remember speaking to a friend of mine over in Africa where they don't have a secondary market, and they were talking about how it, it becomes a situation where you basically are saving your whole life to buy the materials to build that house. It might take you 30 years to build a house and they save the money to do that. And then you can't get that money back out through any type of lending or anything, so that becomes a house. And you wonder why so many people have little cinder block shacks because that's all they can do because they don't have access to capital. And yet still you see the United States, how things are so, so very different because there's access to capital through a secondary market. So. It just helps me to always appreciate on the world scale why that's so important. And as I've grown in my career and got deeper into certain commercial real estate deals, you know, access to capital becomes everything. So, you know, we certainly appreciate the work that you're doing. It's very impressive. And uh, we certainly want to encourage you to keep on going with it. So, you know, I want to thank you for that. So uh, this, this message here is from MI Phone, and there's a lot of notes here. So, Patricia, if you don't mind, if you can uh, unmute yourself and... Um, ask you a question and kind of give us uh, the point that you were trying to bring out here. Yes. Hi, Joel. Thanks uh, again for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Deshaun, for your time and being here and sharing such great information. You said something that that surprised me, and I don't know, might surprise others. I had heard previously that um, you can 
raise money from relatives and people that you have a significant relationship with. I don't re recall whether there was a threshold amount, a limitation to that. But with you, when you mentioned about that, you know, two thousand dollars from a family member can implicate SEC regulations. I was I was shocked. And so I wanted to um, find out from you, is there a threshold? Is there like a safe harbor where people can raise capital from friends or family that doesn't implicate SEC law? And then related to that, the difference between a loan and an investment, I, that's a basic question, but I just realized a loan you give money and many times people expect interest. An In investment people give money and expect interest in return. So what what's the technical difference from a legal standpoint between a loan and an investment um, as well? Because I presume nope. you can get loans from family, but you know, but how would they know the difference? Like how do you discern and make sure that you don't one doesn't get themselves in trouble? So I know that's a lot. Thank you. Yeah, and I might have you repeat the first, the second question because the first okay. question is going to hopefully not confuse you. So one of the things that I reiterate over and over again, and we have service consultations all the time where you can go on my website and we can talk about what it is that you're trying to do. We don't give legal advice, but we talk about services and what you're trying to do. And I always tell people, this is this is as simple as I can put it. Whenever you are raising investment an investment has a as a legal definition, which I'll get to with respect to your second question. Anytime that you are raising investor capital, you have two choices, only two choices. There is no hybrid. There is no safe harbor. There is no if, ands, or buts. If you are raising investor capital from anyone, any amount, anywhere in the United States or abroad, you have to register with the SEC. That's like companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange and do IPOs, initial public offerings, or which is the space that I deal with, you have to find an exemption, meaning it's going to be a private company. When you find, when you are going to find an exemption, you still have to file paperwork. It might not be a lot of paperwork, depending again on your finance and strategy. If it's a lower amount, you might only have to file a few pieces of paper with the SEC, but those are your only two choices. There is no if, ands, there is no, I'm only raising $2,000 from Aunt Susie. Those are your two choices. So mm -hmm. I know that it has been a myth for, and, and people get away with it. I always, I, every time I present to particularly real estate groups, they'll say, oh, well, I heard so-and-so raise $50,000 just from family and friends, ain't filed a piece of paper anywhere. People get away with it. But as your attorney, I am never going to tell you to do something just because you can get away with it. There's two choices. You either register or you file an exemption. There is no ifs, ands, buts, or in between. But because people have been getting away with it, right, because the SEC is not going to come after you borrowing $10,000 from your grandma, right? They just have bigger fish to fry. But that is a violation of SEC rules because there's only two options. Register as a public company or you file an exemption and you still have to file something. So hopefully, I mean, that's as, that's as straightforward as I, as, as I can tell you. Does that answer your, your question? Did she get off the phone? Okay, uh, yeah, that, that was great. One, if you don't mind, just, just for time uh, purpose here. I um, mean, y'all can talk offline, but just real. So, well, first of all, does that answer the first one? Because I don't want to interrupt. Well, that does, but the, she raised, she mentioned investor capital, which goes to the second one. So what, so investor capital, what's investor capital? Because I think that that's the difference between a loan and an investment. That'll get to that question. So, the, uh, so the, the short end of it is a loan. There's usually a promissory note where you're paying interest and it, it, get, it gets first place. Like if you liquidate or you're in bankruptcy, it gets a first lien holder because it's debt saying that I will pay this back when it, and with, with an investment. And that has a very technical meaning that I don't have time to go over. Essentially, um, somebody is saying, I might get my money back and I might not. I realize it's a risk. I might get interest. I might not. I might lose all of my money. And so that's the reason why you have to file paperwork is because of that, because of that risk where you don't have that risk with a loan because you have a promissory note and there's a regulatory scheme for them to get their money back if there's a bankruptcy or liquidation. But anyway, I have a whole course on yeah. debt versus capital for, for this very reason. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is great. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you for participating and, and asking your question. 
And um, yeah, just just to add to your your point, Deshaun, it's you know you think of the capital stack, uh, loans are generally secured, and so for that reason, you you know they have a different structure. But equity, which is why we call it debt, equity on the other hand, you're basically saying I hope I get my money back because I'm basically right. investing alongside you. So it's a different structure without that underlying security of the asset. So uh, we appreciate that. And let's see, we had um, Mr. Uriah. What's up, buddy? I guess I can ask the question for him. I guess he, he might be where it's noisy. <clears throat> Happy belated birthday to Sean. Two questions. From a syndication fundraising approach for a real estate deal, what are your thoughts between forming an S Corp versus an LLC? So let's start with that one. What's your thoughts uh, as it relates to forming an S Corp or an LLC when raising capital for a real estate deal? Well, thanks for the happy belated birthday, Ms. Robinson. I appreciate it. So I can give you the perspective from a legal standpoint. I always tell people when you're thinking about capital structure and company structure, there's always going to be a legal sort of uh, advice you can get and a accounting and tax advice. I don't give tax advice at all, period. So all I can do is tell you what the differences are from a legal standpoint. If you're worried about taxes, you have to go talk to a CPA about that. But I will tell you that generally what I see as far as real estate syndications is either an LLC or a C Corp, not an S Corp, because an S Corp is going to limit the amount of investors that you have. And there's some other accounting restraints on that. So I usually see real estate syndication set up as an S, uh, a C Corp or as an LLC. For example, I have a real estate syndication with four of the Black women here in DeKalb County. We're set up as an LLC. And I mean, you, you get essentially the same protections that you would under a C Corp. And the laws are less rigid than with a C Corp. A C Corp, C Corps are very sophisticated uh, structures. They 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 have been around for a long time, so there's a lot of rules around them. But LLCs are uh, a new form of legal protection, and they just require they they allow more flexibility, in my opinion, when you're trying to do things. Okay, all right, appreciate that. And then the second question he had was, uh, could you share some insights on how? Uh, to discover different financial capital resources available for development efforts aimed to drive economic impact and job creation? Okay, that's a loaded question. Yeah. So I will tell you what I do. I sign up for e-newsletters that I'm interested in, you know, and all of this is depending on, when you talk about economic impact, a lot of this is going to be local too. So if you're in Georgia, you might want to follow either the, the chambers, the big chambers that we have here, or sign up for the Atlanta Business Chronicle or Black Enterprise or something like that. So it really depends on what specific capital resources you're trying to get in touch with, because if you're trying to get in touch with grants, the Minority Business Development Agency has some really good information about grants, but that's very different if you're looking for investor capital, where you would sign up for something like PitchBook, which gives you sort of the rundown on the venture capital and private equity space. So it really depends on what financial resources you're looking uh, for. There's a big regulatory scheme when it comes to financial resources and things. So I would say just hone in on the locale first and then try to pinpoint what type of resources you're trying to get and sign up for their e-newsletters. That's what I do. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm in a much quieter place now. Thank you. And that's for my question. Okay. Did you have another question or did that pretty much cover it? You are <laughs> no absolutely I was referring more specifically more specifically to Georgia. Um, also between Fulton and DeKalb County more specifically. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Sean, anything else on that? Or, well, I think you answered that. Like you said, focus on the locale. I do know also that uh, Invest Atlanta has a lot of good information and has uh, access to those other resources that can give you access to capital as well. So you might want to look at that. And they kind of have that mandate that you were talking about there of being able to uh, drive economic impact and job creation. Mm -hmm. Think about there. All right. Anything else on that, Deshaun, or is that pretty much cover what you wanted to share? Yeah, I, I would just say if you're looking hyper local, which it seems like you might be for counties, you can always look through the county economic development department or DeKalb County has a economic arm. I just forget what it's called right now, but. Um, Decide DeKalb. 
Yes, decide to count. And so if you if you get connected with them, then they will be a great source if you're looking hyper local, which is in County. Thank you. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. So now you mentioned uh, one other thing that because um, you said that you don't actually raise capital. So how do you work in, in that particular space? Because I know you said you tell companies, you know, be able to, to raise this capital. Was it primarily by the, the legal regulatory aspect of it? And, and what do you do for those companies once you get them set up and all teed up to go? Uh, what's the next step for them? Yeah, so like I mentioned before, so we are a, a law firm and investment advisory firm. However, if anybody is familiar with FINRA, you know that there are several licenses. This is a very complicated sort of how money moves. And there's several licenses that you can get under FINRA, which is the federal regulatory industry. And so I have a Series 65, so I can give investment advice. But there's also broker-dealer licenses that's regulated by FINRA as well. In order for you to go out and raise capital for people, we call them finders as well. You do need a broker-dealer license, and we don't have a broker-dealer license on purpose because it's just too much conflict. So we do the regulatory thing. So a lot of times people will come to us before they want to raise capital. We sit down, we do a strategy with them and they will go out and either hire a broker dealer or a finder, or they, if they're doing something like a pre-seed round, maybe they have their circle of family or friends, or if they're doing something like crowdfunding, you don't really need a finder necessarily because you're using the crowd anyway. And then once they come to us and we've decided, or they've decided on the financing strategy that they that they want to use, then we sit down with them and, and, and get the documentation that we need to establish our relationship relationship and our fees. And we talk about what the roadmap looks like, because some regulatory things you can only raise within 12 months. So some things, depending on your financing strategy, you only have 12 months to get it done before we have to file something else. So we got 12 months, essentially. So we sit down and we map out what I need from you, uh, what I'm going to do, what the timeline looks like, what you need to do and don't do, and you know, check in when we need to to make sure that everything is is on course. Um, the way my firm fee structure is structured is most of our fees are flat fee because we want you to at the end of the day to be able to put on your your balance sheet a definite amount as as opposed to billing by the hour, which I think is just just not an efficient way in my opinion to do it. We know how much time it takes for us to do what we need to do, but it's certainty for you. But it, we, our packages essentially span from what I call a hoopty service all the way up to a Cadillac service. So I can get you to whatever destination you want to go. The difference is the experience of the ride. So I tell people, if you want to raise capital and make sure you're compliant, we can get you to that goal. It just depends on if you want to stop every now and again and change a tire or if you want a bumpy ride or if you don't want champagne in the back. So we have those packages set up so everybody has a different, you know, whatever experience it is that they can afford and that they want. But really, it's meant to be a partnership, right? Because at the end of the day, my goal is to help you to raise the capital that you want. But it does take a, a, a understanding and a cooperation and it takes work and, and constantly communicating with, a, uh, with you. But that is what we're meant to do is to be a partner, to be part of your team and walk you through the process from start to finish. And it's a lot easier if we start at the beginning as opposed to coming in because it's just more expensive. It's more of a headache. It's just the sooner the better is what I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned giving that a six to 12 month runway. So I, I think that's a very powerful point as well. Get with you earlier than later. You might ask about, uh, could you speak high level to some of the requirements to qualify for an exemption from uh, registration in Georgia? Registration from what? Uh, registration from the SEC um, in terms of being able to raise uh, investor funds and not necessarily have to go through the similar rigor as compared to companies that have to register for IPOs, NASDAQ, and New York Stock Exchange listings in terms of registering to take in those investor funds. Okay. Um, well, what you might be talking about is the Invest Georgia exemption that allows Georgia-based companies to raise up to $5 million. I'm an attorney, so it's not an exemption to registration. 
essentially what it is, is a carve out to being under the jurisdiction of the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is which is a little different than being an exemption. But the point is, is you don't have to register with the Securities and Exchange Commission. But if you go to the Secretary of State's website and you search for Invest Georgia exemption, it will give you the general details about what it needs to make that happen. But if you are a Georgia registered company, either a foreign company or an actual domestic company, I always recommend it if you if you meet the requirements, which is you have to you know be registered in Georgia. And if you only want to raise money from Georgia investors. Now, when you're talking about real estate, a lot of times this doesn't work in real estate because you got investors in New York and all over the place. You have to be a Georgia resident to participate, to be an investor in this in, in this type of exemption. So a lot of times it doesn't work for real estate. And the cap is $5 million, which that sounds like a lot of money, but we know in real estate, especially if you're doing a multi-development and from the ground up, $5 million is nothing. So a lot of times this does not work for real estate um, because of the low threshold and the limitation that it can only be Georgia investors. But it's definitely worth checking out because the compliance portion is only a three-page form. You fill it out, you send it in, you're done with it compliance portion as opposed to all the paperwork you have to do with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now, that doesn't mean, I always have to give this disclaimer, just because you can use the Invest Georgia exemption if you qualify and if that's what you want to do, just because it's a three-page form to do the compliance, you still need to have a set of internal corporate documents. So whenever you're raising capital, just think about two things. You have to do compliance and you need to do the internal documents. The compliance you have to do, that's legally requirement. You don't have to do most internal legal documents, but it's very dumb not to because you're trying to protect you. So just remember that, but I will check out the Invest Georgia exemption on the Secretary of State's website and they'll give you that. Uh, they even have a downloadable PDF that'll give you all those details. Got it. No, that's that's awesome. I, and I guess I was referring more to securities registration, getting exemptions from that regards. So I believe that there are certain federal and state security exemptions from registration for like yes. certain security offerings. Yes. So you're you must be talking of. Uh, uh, I'm having a hard time understanding specifically what your question your question is. So if, if this is an interstate. Uh, what we call an intrastate offering. So this this it doesn't fall within the Securities and Exchange purview. So you don't have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. There are certain securities that are exempt from registration as well, but that that is a, a separate discussion because we'll be on here forever if we start talking about the different securities that you don't have to register certain types Got of bonds and things like that. So I don't want to okay. I don't want to go through that whole thing. But if that's what you're talking about. There is the Georgia Secretary of State's Office, the Securities Division. If you go under their tab, they might provide some information more in detail about the types of securities that are exempt from SEC registration. Or you can go to the SEC website yourself. It's just sec.gov. It's a great place. They have a capital raising hub on the SEC website where they talk about a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about. It, um, they give you updates. They have public events. They have committee meetings and all types of uh, of things. So if you're not familiar with the SEC website, I encourage you to go on there and take a look around. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Sounds good. So, now Sean, it's been fantastic. I appreciate you getting with us. And uh, as we prepare to wrap up, I'm going to give you the, the final word here to kind of emphasize something that you mentioned. And I think it was before we, we actually went live on our call today, we were kind of talking offline. And um, you had mentioned about this goal that you have as it relates to minority businesses and uh, what you would like to see. Do you mind sharing that with the, with the rest of our audience today? Or do you remember what you said? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're talking about the, my personal and professional goal of creating as many Black millionaires and billionaires as possible, yes, let me reemphasize that, you know, I'm, I'm a true believer that I have honed in on this talent and gift, not to keep it to myself, but to to make sure I spread it to the world to the world. So I just and you know encourage people to really get into that knowledge base and and you know if we need to have a discussion, then 
you know, please let's chat about it. You can book something on my website, but please at the very least follow me on social media or YouTube or sign up for one of the classes because we're, we're here to help you. And as I stated, the sooner, the better. And let's go out there and and create as many millionaires and billionaires um, in our black community as possible. Yeah, yeah. And kind of going full circle here as to what we started the discussion on. If that's going to happen, what's the main thing that everybody has to have access to? Capital. Access to capital. Access to capital. You're never going to do, you're not going to save a hundred million dollars and buy some building downtown. It ain't going to happen. Right. Right. So you got to have access to capital. You have to know how to tap those resources, but you have to know how to do it legally, uh, which is one reason why we asked our Sean to come on because um, this is a very important space. And, you know, the, the work that we do to Sean, we, we get calls all the, well, I mean, it's what we do, right? So we're always working and helping people uh, get the capital that they need for their deals. But oftentimes, to your point, a lot of times people come to us and their, their deals are half-baked because they're not really invested ready. You know, they don't have the pieces in place in order to really be talking to investors. Uh, you know, why do I need a security lawyer? Why do I need this? Why do I need a zoning lawyer? Why do I, I mean, you know, they, they just don't understand that. So, you know, we certainly appreciate you coming on and bringing that. You had a final thought that you showed us about that? Well, uh, as you know, I went through the REAP Academy. Oh, my God. I think it was during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, during you. 2020. And I'm a, you know, I'm a lifelong learner. So I have four degrees and two licenses because I just love learning. Right. But what that academy really helped me to understand, I mean, I have an MBA and so I can do pro formas in my sleep. But what it really honed in on is really the importance of of, uh, not only access to, to capital, but about community. And that was really a word that kept coming up throughout the course of the academy is really getting the community involved in whatever project that you have, particularly when you're talking about real estate, because it's something physical, it's something that people can see. And that really helped refine me, I think, as an attorney, because the same way that you need a community when you're doing real estate syndication, you really do need community when you're raising capital. So for anybody who um, is looking to get more insight, I, um, you know, the REAP Academy was really eye-opening for me. And I'm, and I'm glad that I went through it because it just honed in on my commercial real estate uh, skills. And I, I, I just encourage it for, for everyone who loves to loves to learn like I do. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. And thank you for bringing that out. We certainly appreciate that. And uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to, to see uh, yourself as a, as a product of REAP and all the great things that you're doing and giving back to the community to try to advance um, uh, investment in commercial real estate and, and knowledge and understanding uh, that's needed there as well. So, Bashan, it's been fantastic. I thank you so much for being here today. And uh, any final words before we go? Nope, just keep learning, keep growing. You know, life is 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 meant to to live full and die empty as, as my personal model is. So do what it is that you that makes you scared and a capital raising can be one of those things. But I want you to know that there is there is a community here to help you. You just have to reach out. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Because that can take away the fear, right? Yes. You don't, don't want your uh, obituary reading coulda woulda shoulda. Exactly. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate it. And if anybody's interested in talking a little bit more, then please reach out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we'll catch up. But we got some things to talk about as well. So look forward to that, Deshaun. And it's been fantastic. And for all of you today, we want to thank you so much for being here with the Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. It's been exciting. Please continue to join us and share this our podcast with all your friends and family as well that you think can benefit from. It. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to write a brief review. And as always, continue to invite, share, and subscribe.